This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number three. Welcome to the third episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility related. Um, If any of the topics that we're talking about today resonate with you or if you just want to connect with me and say hello, you can tweet me at Fertile Friday and if you have any comments or questions about today's podcast, please stop by the blog and leave a comment in the show notes for today's episode at www.fertilityfriday.com slash show three. So that's show and the number three. And you can just click on the podcast tab to show notes for previous episodes also. Um, So today we'll be talking about what to do when you start charting your cycles and your cycles don't quite look like the perfect charts that you've seen in the books. We'll be talking about how charting your cycles can actually help you to identify health issues that are fertility related and otherwise. And I'm so excited to welcome today's guest, Rose Uchuk, back to the podcast. So if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to the previous episode, which is episode two, make sure to check it out. Rose and I delve into the fertility awareness method and provide you with a great foundation of information about charting your cycles, especially if this is the first time you've heard about it, or even if you know a little bit about it and you just want a little bit more in-depth information. Uh, So Rose has been charting her own cycles for over 16 years now, and she's been been teaching the fertility awareness method for about as long. She has a wealth of knowledge in this area and has spent years teaching women how to chart and interpret their fertile signs using the fertility awareness method. Uh, Rose is also a Justice Holistic Reproductive Health Practitioner or HRHP for short. Justice is one of the few organizations that offers in-depth training for women who want to learn to teach the fertility awareness method to others. And as an HRHP, Rose is also able to help women identify any reproductive health problems that may show up in a woman's charts after she has started charting her cycles. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Rose Uchuk back to the Fertility Friday podcast. Welcome, Rose. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's great to be back. Oh, so happy to have you. Um, So for our listeners who haven't yet heard the previous episode, maybe you could tell us a bit about what brought you to this work and how the work that you do extends beyond just teaching the fertility awareness method and into the realm of health restoration and healing. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I came to this basically because I wanted a method of birth control that was going to be effective, but uh, I didn't want to go on the birth control pill. And that was way back, like I was, you know, 18, 19 when I started researching this, and about 19 when I started charting. And at the time, I read a bunch of books, and I tried my best to figure it out. And I started charting, and it worked for birth control. And I thought, great, I, I'm never going back. This is this is for me. And it's something that, like uh, like you say, I did start charting pretty much right away. And over the years, it's become so much more than just keeping track of what's going on with my fertility. It's really been an invaluable tool for understanding what's going on with my health. And I, I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more as we go, but I have had some fairly serious health issues that charting has helped me to sort out and at least to get a proper diagnosis and to figure out a treatment plan. So that is actually almost more than anything what convinced me to um, <clears throat> to do the full justice training because it was so valuable for my health to see what was going on. Uh, so I thought, yeah, I, other women need this. Absolutely. And I, I can relate because when I first started charting, it was all about just learning how to use it. But then mm-hmm. after you do learn how to use it, it, it turns out to be such an important tool in being able to diagnose different health issues you, you had no idea at first. Exactly. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what charting is and what the signs are that people need to keep track of, especially for brand new listeners that may not be familiar. Sure. Well, the, the cycle charting is keeping track of the body's fertile signs to tell where the fertile window is. And in most women, that's about a week of the cycle. So there's sort of a myth out there that you can get pregnant at any time at random, and that's not true. You can, you can only get pregnant at a specified time, and you can identify what that time is. And so 
Uh, for cycle charting, you keep track of your cervical mucus, which is like a lot of women notice this without really understanding what it is, but it sort of might, might look kind of like lotion or kind of like egg white. And women will notice it on their panties or at the vulva when they're, you know, checking on their toilet paper, or they might notice it in a sexual context and be like, wow, there's just a lot more stuff there today mm -hmm. than there was. Uh, so that's one of the signs, keeping track of mucus because it's a sign of fertility. And the second one is temperature, taking your basal body temperature first thing in the morning. And then the third sign is the position of the cervix itself. It actually moves over the cycle. Okay. And so to give us a frame of reference, because today we'll be talking a little bit about cycles that fall outside of the range of healthy or special charting considerations. So, so that we have a frame of reference, what do normal or healthy cycles look like? So how would I know if I have a healthy cycle? Mm -hmm. So there's actually a fair bit of variation in a healthy cycle. So, you know, it's not like we're all sort of 28 day robots and everybody <laughs> ovulates on day 14. Like there's a lot of, you know, women are different and cycles are different. But what we would say is a healthy cycle is if all the parameters of the cycle are kind of in a certain range. So you're looking at a, a period that's maybe four to seven days long, like averaging about five days. Any, sh any shorter than that and, or any longer than that, we start to be concerned. And very heavy or very light bleeding, we start to be concerned as well that there might be uh, something going on. So, but like I say, a you know, four to, four to seven day period averaging five days with the first maybe two or three days being like fairly heavy to moderate bleeding where you'd be changing your pad like, you know, maybe four to six times a day for the first two days and then tapering off to a lighter flow. We'd consider that to be healthy. And we'd consider, um, you know, you might have some cramping, but generally like if there's really severe cramping, then that's something that we want to investigate. We would, if you're like flat out on your back, you know, your period's knocking you out, then we're like, okay, that's a concern. But generally like to feel sort of like you don't really want to talk to anybody, you're kind of irritable, a little bit crampy, <laughs> that's pretty healthy and normal as long as it lasts for a day or two. Um, so a uh, healthy cycle length we say is 25 to 36 days. So if you're roughly within that, even if you vary from month to month, if you're in 25 to 36, it's still fairly healthy. Uh, the average is about 28, but a lot of women will be over that or under that. So it's it is normal to have cycles vary by a few days like very few of us are exactly like clockwork and then the number of cervical days of cervical mucus is typically about three to six days with an average of four days so if there's hardly any mucus in the cycle then that's a concern and if there's continuous mucus that's also a concern but if you're sort of like you know three to six days that's what we would consider healthy. And then the other parameter we would look at is the length of the luteal phase. So we, I think we talked about this in the last episode, that the luteal phase is the length of time from when you ovulate until your next period comes. And usually it's a fixed number of days. And so if it's about averaging about 13 days, we would say that's healthy, like 12 to 14 days of, from ovulation until the next period is considered healthy. If it's less than that, then that could be a fertility concern. I think that that is such great information. And it's so unfortunate that I think for many people, this would be the first time that they've really heard it broken down, what a healthy cycle actually looks like. Um, mm -hmm. Because I know for myself, I've gone to the doctor before and asked questions about, you know, my periods being heavy and painful. And doctors don't have answers. Uh, unfortunately, they're not trained in these areas. So that is just, it's so important to know, to have a reference point to say this is healthy. And especially because, well, you can let me know about some of the clients you've worked with, but my impression from my friends, my own personal experience and all the women that I know is that most women have some sort of indication that falls outside of what you just described as healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's getting increasingly common, like with uh, Geraldine Mattis, who is my mentor and my instructor in all of this, she's the person who trained me, and she's been teaching since the 70s, and she says frequently that when she first started teaching, most women had normal cycles, and so they could learn this very simply because their charts look pretty similar to the textbook, and now it's it's the opposite, where it's, it's sort of a very rare percentage of women who have normal and healthy cycles, and most have some sort of disturbance, and she thinks this has to do with just the fact that the birth control pill and all other hormonal contraceptives are being used so commonly and a lot of women of our generation, their mothers have been on it, maybe even their grandmothers. So we don't know what's the impact for fertility for these powerful drugs being used. And then as well, just, you know, the 
decline in in nutrition and food quality that soils are declining worldwide that people are busy they're not necessarily eat you know cooking from scratch there's a lot of processed foods and there's a lot of chemicals in the environment that disrupt hormones so like yeah a lot of factors combining to impact health well yeah and as you said if if your chart doesn't quite look like what is the perfect one it makes it adds another layer of complexity to learning the fertility awareness method because here you are getting so excited about this new method it's awesome but then your chart doesn't match and then i think a lot of women hit that roadblock Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what exactly charting is so how is charting yourself because we use that word a lot charting charting so maybe people don't know what that is yeah (laughs) and how is it different to say a period app that tells me when i can expect to bleed Okay, so a, a lot of uh, like a lot of uh, women are charting on period apps. They're super common. Like I know so many people have them on their phones, and many of the apps out there are just rhythm method calculators. So what they do is we were talking about that length of the luteal phase a couple of minutes ago, saying that there's a f- fixed number of days from when you ovulate until your next period comes, and so from that you can do a mathematical formula to say, okay, well let's look at past cycles. We can subtract and find out when ovulation was, and then we can try to use a formula to predict when, when it will be in the future. And so that's what most apps do. If they predict when your period is coming or predict your fertile time, it's using rhythm method type calculations. And those types of apps or devices will say things like, you know, it takes time to learn your cycle, but after a few cycles have been in, the the program will learn your cycle and will know how to calculate it. Um, So that, yeah, that's not what we're talking about. And I, I really want to make the point that any kind of charting or awareness is helpful. So there are women out there who just mark on their calendar when's their first day and when's their last day, or maybe they track where they are with regard to the cycles of the moon. So I think any kind of awareness is is valuable. Um, And what we're specifically talking about as a diagnostic tool is a type of standardized charting where you're observing your mucus and your temperature in a standardized way. So it's like collecting scientific data. And then if you follow the, the um, the sort of the step-by-step directions to collect it that way, then we can assess your menstrual cycle health using your charts as a diagnostic tool. And there has been a lot of research studies done where the, uh, they've done blood tests for women every single day of the cycle. And every time I tell the story, I always think of those women and I say, thank you for going in and getting a blood test and a needle in your arm every single day um, while they were charting. And then they compared what they knew about the women's hormones from the blood tests to what the charts looked like. And they were able to then say these types of hormone patterns show up in this way on the chart. Um, so the type of standardized charting we're talking about is uh, the justice method is what I'm trained in. So that's the, the charting method that I'm uh, talking about. There may be other methods that are, you could use for the similar purpose, but I'm not as informed about other methods. So I'll just stick to uh, talking about the justice method since that's my training. So the t- t- checking your mucus, we say you want to check on your toilet paper and see what's there every time you wipe and to check throughout the day before and after every time you go to the bathroom as well as uh, we just say every time your pants are down (laughs) so you know if you're going to take a shower or you know you get up in the middle of the night or you, you get up to pee or for any reason you have the opportunity you check and checking on your toilet paper and the reason that that's significant is that a lot of women will do internal checks for a mucus so they'll check with a finger on the inside or check at the vulva And that's something I see so commonly with people who have learned from Taking Charge of Your Fertility, a really great book that a lot of people start charting from. And in that book, she says, check internally. But the thing is that the the vagina is normally uh, self-lubricating. It's normally moist. So anytime you check what's inside the vagina, there's going to be something there. Um, So checking on your toilet paper makes it clear that it's cervical mucus and it's not uh, any sort of like vaginal cell slough or or just the normal moisture or the normal healthy cells that are in the vagina. And I can certainly relate to that because when I started charting, I checked internally as well. And having done both for several years doing one and several years doing the other, I've found the external checking to just be more definitive. It's easier to identify dry day. (laughs) It's much easier to identify dry day when uh, yeah because then when you're checking internally every day seems like it's a, a wet day or a mucus totally. day yeah exactly because there's always something in there and that's normal and healthy but then sometimes women will be like oh like i can't understand my cycle i have mucus all the time it's like well switching to toilet paper checking um and folding the toilet paper into a little flat square when you wipe then you, you pretty much just see cervical mucus and the um 
you know, whatever might be in your vagina would not actually show up on the toilet paper except as a bit of moisture. It wouldn't show up in the same way that cervical mucus is like you could pick it up and you can play with it. And, yeah, it uh, helps you to really determine the difference between the two. And when you talked about what exactly charting is and how it's different, I like that you described that it's more of it's more of an observational thing, right? More of checking to see what's actually there instead of this idea about how many days was my last cycle? What am I predicting? All that kind of stuff. So, yeah. yeah. It, exactly, because we change, you know, it's, it's normal. Like the seasons affect us, like stress affects things. If you change your diet, it can affect your cycle. So the point is to say, what's happening today? What can I learn about my body today? And if you're charting for a number of years, like I, my charts sure have changed compared to when I was 19. They don't, it looks like I'm a different person by comparison. You wouldn't think this is the same chart. But yeah, I mean, a 36 year old woman is different than a 19 year old woman. It's Yeah, no, that's so true. Yeah. And so when it comes to charting, especially for especially when women are just starting and their charts aren't really looking like what it you know, what it looks like in the book. What are some of the, the common health concerns that can be identified through charting as a diagnostic tool, as you mentioned? OK, so let me just take a step back before I answer your question, because I wanted to talk to you about temperature and how oh, to that's right. get that accurate. So temperature, um, a lot of people use a digital thermometer these days. Generally, say a glass thermometer is more precise, but they're harder to get. So a lot of people use a digital thermometer, but with either type, it's important to leave it in place for a full 10 minutes. So you take your temperature first thing in the morning before you get out of bed, because then it's measuring your metabolism. And so if you put it in your mouth or stick it under your arm, to leave it in place for a full 10 minutes and then look at the reading. So a digital thermometer will go off really quickly. Like it'll beep within a minute or so, but sometimes it's just not as accurate. It doesn't really warm up fully. Like the way a digital thermometer works is it'll kind of measure how fast your temperature is rising and extrapolate and sort of predict a reading. Um, so keeping it in place for the full 10 minutes and then hitting the button and then doing the reading will give you a better, uh, a better temperature graph. It'll be more precise. Um, and if it's glass, then yeah, just leave it in place for 10 minutes. There's no button to worry about. And what a lot of people do is that they um, just hit, set their snooze alarm for 10 minutes. You know, alarm goes off, you pop the thermometer in, you hit snooze, and then 10 minutes later, you check the reading. Yeah, that's good to know, especially because when you're using it, you need to have the kind of exact reading day to day. And so yeah. getting the most accurate reading by leaving it in for that full 10 minutes is uh, is really it's good information to have. I don't think a lot of people would necessarily think to do that. Mm -hmm, exactly. And did you mention um, cervical position? Oh yeah, no, I didn't. And cervical position, I would say, is not as crucial as a diagnostic tool. But I'll talk into how to do it. So checking cervical position, you'd want to um, basically just check with a finger and see where the cervix is. And it feels about like a grape with a dimple in it. That's about the size of it, and it's at the end of the vagina. And so, uh, and some women would notice it during sex. Like they might notice that sometimes like sex is, feels different just because the position of the cervix moves around uh, during the cycle. Or, or sometimes if somebody is using tampons or is using like a diva cup, we were talking about this last time, like you might just be aware of the cervix in inserting uh, those types of, um, of menstrual products. And so checking the cervix, you want to, you just have to do it once a day. It's not like checking cervical mucus where you're doing it constantly mm -hmm. all day. Um, and you're just checking for the changes in texture of the cervix. So it'll, in the fertile time, we say the acronym for the cervix is uh, soft, high, open, and wet. Uh, so show, soft, high, show, soft, high, open, and wet. So uh, around ovulation, it'll be more soft like your lips, and it'll be a little higher and trickier to reach, and it'll feel more open, and it'll, there'll be more wetness because it'll have the mucus present. And uh, outside of that, it'll be pointed more back towards the rectum. It'll typically be lower and the texture will be more like uh, firmer, like your nose. Okay. So yeah. we have the different fertile signs and the, although the cervical position is important, but less important to identify, say a health concern, whereas the cervical mucus and the basal body temperature, that's where you're going to get into more of being able to identify if there's a problem. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, of course, if somebody's checking her cervix regularly, she might notice like, oh, gee, like all of a sudden it feels weird or it's really tender or, um, you know, like I, it seems like it's, I'm having more cramping and my cervix is in a different position. Like that might point to, you know, some, some sort of anatomical thing going on. But typically, yeah, we'd look at mucus and temperature as a diagnostic tool. Okay. And so with that in mind, then, um, 
what are some of the things that a person might notice? Like I know that um, I've heard of and experienced some different things, whereas like some people might observe continuous mucus. So even if they're checking properly, it, they're having a really hard time figuring out when they're fertile because there's some degree of mucus that they're observing most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so what might be an unusual chart? So yeah, that would be a good one, like either continuous mucus where there's mucus going constantly or scant mucus where there's hardly any to speak of. Uh, both of those things would be a concern. And uh, both of those can also happen coming off the pill. So I know we're going to talk about that a bit more in a future show. What are the types of things that you can see? But yeah, so somebody who's just come off the pill and just charting might see both of those things. Uh, PCOS, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which we'll let's talk about a bit more later in the show. But just to mention that that often might have a continuous mucus situation. Um, yeah, and th uh, thyroid can can affect the amount of issue, if there, the amount of mucus if there's a thyroid issue. So uh, maybe I know we're going to talk about all of those in turn as the program goes on. So um, I guess to answer your question most precisely, yeah, if, you, if you're seeing more than that three to six days of mucus, if you've got mucus pretty much all the time from the end, you know, from your, from your period up until mid cycle, or sometimes women will have mucus, um, not as, not as much before their, um, their ovulation which, and if it's, if it's there cons consistently before ovulation, then we want to look more at like estrogen dominance. Is there like an excessive amount of uh, estrogen in the system? And if it's, if there's a lot of mucus present after ovulation, when there shouldn't be, the mucus really should be drying up, then we want to look at, is there a progesterone deficiency? Because progesterone should be suppressing the mucus production. Oh, okay. Yeah. I hope that's making sense. I know I'm getting technical, but. Well, there's so much to unpack there because um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that when it comes to a lot of the, the issues that show up in the menstrual cycle, it's often rooted in, just as you mentioned, a hormonal imbalance. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how an imbalance of hormones can play out on a chart, what it can look like, and um, just talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so I think one of, one of the really common things we see is if they're if there's sort of not quite enough progesterone. So I think we talked about this last show as well, where the, the estrogen and progesterone are sort of the two dominant hormones in a woman's cycle. And estrogen is more active on the body prior to ovulation. So estrogen, as estrogen levels rise, that's what stimulates the cervix to produce cervical mucus. And some women notice other changes too. So they might feel like they have more desire, like they're hornier to, to, not, <laughs> to not put a fine point on it. Um, or, you know, they might like notice skin changes or they might sometimes be more outgoing. That's kind of the stereotype around ovulation. Uh, whereas progesterone, um, so after you ovulate, pro the progesterone really kicks in and progesterone tends to have more of like an introspective focus as far as its effect on moods. And uh, progesterone also has a complementary effect to estrogen as far as building up bone density. So like estrogen is a hormone that really promotes growth. Um, so whereas progesterone kind of organizes things and structures them, like an analogy I heard was that estrogen is sort of like delivers the building materials to the site and just leaves them there in a pile, whereas progesterone organizes them and puts the house up. Uh, so you really need both in order to have cardiovascular health and good bone density and, uh, you know, stable moods, like they have a complementary effect on the body. But I love that analogy, by the way. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. It really puts it into perspective what each hormone is doing mm -hmm. and why it could be a problem to have more of one and not as enough of the other. Because if you just have the estrogen bringing stuff in and bringing stuff in, but you don't have the progesterone organize it, then what happens to all the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And the thing about estrogen dominance too, where there's sort of estrogen is kind of overactive, it's not being counterbalanced by progesterone, is that there's so many estrogen mimicking chemicals in the environment. So plastics and pesticides and petroleum products and all these types of things are affecting us in various ways. And so it, it's, you know, almost like getting extra doses of synthetic hormones just from the environment, from cosmetics, from all kinds of things. Well, that kind of leads perfectly into estrogen dominance. Um, and I'd love to talk about that a little bit because I, obviously, as you mentioned, we're kind of being, estrogen is being thrown at us in all different mm -hmm. ways. And 
I think that for me, especially after having having a baby, I kind of took all the, you know, all the fragrances and stuff out just because I was concerned about him being exposed to it. But yeah. it, it made such a profound, not just one thing, but it made such a profound difference in my own cycle, getting rid yeah. of all of those um, estrogens. Oh, but wow, really? What did you notice? I'm, I'm curious about that. Well, see, I, I kind of, I got rid of all the, the smelly lotions. And so yeah. I started using coconut oil. And yeah. um, and I, I'm just trying to think of all the different things. But essentially, I kind of moved away from all the stuff with smells, whether it was shampoo yeah. or soap or whatever, to moving into stuff without smells, which is mm. coconut oil, shea butter, and, you know, soap from the natural store that doesn't have any stuff in it. And, oh, yeah. and also just that was kind of the tip of the iceberg. But one, I did notice that I've always struggled with um, really painful periods. And mm -hmm. so that's not the only thing that I did, but I feel that it did play a role in the fact that now I have completely painless periods. It's kind that's of, awesome. it's the most bizarre thing because when I say painful, they were painful for maybe 16 years. Like it's, it was yeah. the, all the time. And now yeah. there's absolutely no pain, which is, it's, it, yeah, it almost feels surreal, to be honest. Wow, that's great. Yeah, because I mean, I, I personally, I can't handle scented stuff. The scents make me crazy, so I've never used them. So I generally say take them out, but it's nice to hear such a strong change for you. Well, now that I have taken them out, I'm more like you in the sense that like I, it's really hard for me to handle the smells now because now they smell so much stronger to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of, I can't help but wonder when I'm out in the world and every woman smells like peach cobbler uh -huh. <laughs> and strawberry something, I can't yeah. help but wonder what impact that's having on, on all of us, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the signs of estrogen dominance? What does it look like? Okay, so... Um... It would definitely look like we were going to talk next about the luteal phase. So it would look like, I mean, progesterone and estrogen being out of balance. So like we said, what what does a healthy cycle looks look like? It looks like, you know, 25 to 36 days with a 12 to 14 day luteal phase. So one of the signs would be a shorter luteal phase, which is saying that there's not enough progesterone to counterbalance that estrogen. So you'd say, you know, you might have nine or 10 days or even six days, then that's sort of, you can tell right away that the progesterone isn't getting enough of a foothold in the body to counterbalance it. Um, it would show up all re really in a pronounced way, estrogen dominance as women approach perimenopause or menopause. So um, like a lot of the symptoms that we hear of are like, are sort of simultaneously either a progesterone deficiency or estrogen dominance. So like, um, you know, like the really extreme mood swings or the um, hot flashes or, um, you know, these sort of more dramatic changes that people go through as they approach perimenopause. Often we're looking at est like estrogen dominance or progesterone deficiency. And would heavy periods or painful periods fall into that estrogen dominance or is that something... Mm -hmm. um, they could. It's that it tends to be pretty complex if we're looking at heavy periods. So there's a bunch of different things we want to look at. Like we want to look at, uh, we want to look at diet. We want to look at iron absorption, uh, liver health, um, you know, mineral deficiencies. So yeah, it could be it could be coming to play. But there would be other things I'd be looking at too with heavy periods. Okay, and you mentioned the short luteal phase. So if a woman does notice that her luteal phase is say, like you said, eight days, nine days, but outside of that range of normal that you described, what kind of impact would that could that have on her fertility? Definitely, it can be tricky to get pregnant, if that's the case, because you need the luteal phase to allow the little developing um, embryo a chance to implant. So fertilization happens in the fallopian tubes and implantation where the the little zygote, um, you know, drills into the uterus and, and makes its little comfy bed of the uterine lining. That doesn't happen until seven to 10 days after fertilization. So there's a time lag. And so if you've got a luteal phase, that's your 12 to 14 day average, then that's enough time for the little zygote to drift down the fallopian tube and keep multiplying and then implant. Whereas if the luteal phase is too short, you could be conceiving, but don't have enough progesterone to uh, allow that implantation to take place. So essentially, when the egg is trying to bur burrow in there, the mm -hmm. lining's already falling. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's it's not, and usually, like if there is an implantation successfully, the little developing zygote will send, 
you know, chemical messages to keep the, the uterine lining intact and to increase the amount of progesterone. And it, it's sort of like not even enough time for it to get there and start saying, hey, I'm here, I'm here. It just, it can't even get it, make its little nest. Well, and I feel like this is like a twofold thing. So as a woman who's charting their cycles, who's listening to this, who says, wait a minute, I always have eight days between ovulation and a period, you know, what's going on? So I, I feel like there's twofold. On the one hand, obviously that's not ideal. That's not what we want. But on the other hand, where you can identify this, right? So it's the difference between, you know, going to a healthcare practitioner with no information, I can't get pregnant, and then having to spend however long figuring this out versus going in with a chart that clearly shows that you have short luteal phase so that at least you have something to go on. So I feel mm-hmm. like it can't be understated how important this this information can be. Absolutely, because uh, you could have what looks like a normal 28-day cycle, but a very short luteal phase in that 28-day cycle, and wouldn't wouldn't know it, and your doctor probably wouldn't know it if they're not trained to read charts. Um, and so then it's that's the thing. Yeah, it's very empowering, and it helps charting helps rule out a bunch of possible diagnoses. Um, and identify on what could the specific issue be. And that's really valuable in the case of infertility, especially with women who are getting older and they're like, oh no, the clock is ticking, how much time do I have? If you can save yourself a couple of years of waiting lists and diagnoses and skip ahead, that, like it, it can really be really be invaluable. But so I think, it's, I think it's twofold. I think it's partially, the most important thing is for the woman herself to understand what's going on and to feel informed and to be able to go in and say, no, this is what's going on. I don't need you to stimulate my ovulation with Clomid. I'm ovulating. The issue is a short luteal phase. Let's do an appropriate intervention. Um, But the flip side, too, is the practitioner needs to take the woman seriously, needs to believe what she says about her body, and needs to have some understanding of what to do about it. And so that's the other barrier to get around is if, like, I mean, I've heard stories of women going to the fertility clinic and the nurse just throwing their charts in the garbage and being like, you won't need those. You know, (laughs) we'll we'll take care of this. So that's Mm. something that's... uh, it, it like is 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 challenging to in some cases have to educate your medical practitioner about what you do know about your body. Well, absolutely, because given the fact that most women don't know this information, just it's basic biology, right? And it's it's fair. Once you kind of understand the nuances, it's fairly straightforward charting. It uh-huh. takes a little bit of time to figure out all the the little rules and everything, but once you've got it down, it's fairly straightforward. And it, it's to the point that once you learn, you just think, how could I not know this? Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately, obviously, most people don't. And so, I mean, I've had the experience of going to the doctor with my chart. Um, I had a miscarriage and I went into the doctor just to make sure everything was okay. And I was explaining to the doctor exactly when I ovulated because I could s- tell him exactly when I conceived, right? Like uh-huh. the day. Um, But he completely (laughs) ignored what I said and went based on the first day of my period, which was... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he completely ignored what I said, essentially, because he knew better, right? Yeah. Um, So so you're right. It is twofold. But at least if you have... At least if you have it, then you have... At least you have a better understanding. And maybe it's just time to find a different practitioner. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, or just take it with a grain of salt, because like what you said exactly, where like uh, the implication for a lot of women is they get their pregnancy timed wrong because the doctor's going from the first day of the period, not from the date of ovulation, which could be later than day 14 and often is. Um, and so then what does that mean in far, as far as all of a sudden your due date's coming up and your doctor wants to induce you, but they're timing your entire pregnancy wrong. And like, so if, if, if you're not going on an accurate date of conception, then you could have all kinds of tests throughout your pregnancy saying, oh, your baby's not growing properly and this and that and the other thing. When it's like, no, actually the dating isn't correct using first day of the period. It's most correct using d- known date of ovulation from charting. I've often wondered that because the stand, anything that's standardized, obviously not all babies are going to be the same size, like clearly. Mm-hmm. So I've often wondered that as well in terms of the, the dating of, of the pregnancy. Um, so we've talked a little bit about a short luteal phase and mm-hmm. how it can impact fertility and obviously making it challenging for a woman to get pregnant if the egg just can't get to implantation. So are there, what, what, are, cert- what are things that a woman can do if she does identify that she has a, lort, a, 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 lort, <laughs> a short <laughs> luteal short phase? Luteal phase. 
Yeah. So uh, I'll just give some general suggestions because it's hard to say for any given woman. And so I generally would encourage anybody who's trying to sort this out to find a practitioner. I mean, I do consultations online. Uh, there are many naturopaths or acupuncturists who might be able to work with charts or, you know, a, a doctor who's well educated. So I'll just give some general comments about the types of things that are likely to be helpful and then you would be able to get more specific advice depending on your own situation but with anything to do with a menstrual cycle the menstrual cycle is a sign of overall health so I tend to start by suggesting looking at the diet uh, getting out food allergy testing done taking out allergic foods so that you're reducing the strain on the immune system taking out the strain on the body um, so I mean ideally get testing done if you if it's not possible to get testing done in your area just to look at taking out the most common allergens so say gluten dairy and eggs take them out for six to eight weeks and see if there's a change um, and that actually I just want to backtrack because the amount of time it takes if you're making changes into your in your cycle it usually takes two to three months if you make a change for your cycles to actually reflect it so something like yeah taking diet out for uh, changing your diet for six to eight weeks might not be enough to repair your luteal phase but you would notice if it was working if you had an improvement in other symptoms so an improvement in digestion or lessening of PMS or whatever else is going on for that individual um, but yeah generally I recommend improving diet uh, taking out allergic foods just sticking to whole foods as much as possible I uh, heard sort of I can't remember who this was a quote from but it was the the quote about what you should eat which is buy food that rots and eat it before it does <laughs> That's such very good, simple such good advice <laughs> If it mm -hmm. doesn't go bad, if it won't grow mold, then it's not a good idea to eat. Exactly. Don't put it in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, just to go as much in that direction as possible, like, um, you know, eating, getting enough protein, getting enough healthy fats, you know, taking out trans fats, taking out uh, as much as possible things like artificial sugars or uh, refined sugars, uh, caffeine, um, you know, other stimulants, stimulants like that, uh, any, any kind of like, uh, you know, pop or sort of like the worst offenders, everybody knows what, uh, you know, smoking, like just generally doing those sorts of things to improve health. And then um, it's usually a good idea to add in a multivitamin, multimineral, like sort of like a good quality complex to cover all of your bases. And then for luteal phase specifically, there's a lot you can do with uh, oils and and there's a protocol called seed cycling that I'll, I'll, I'll post for your show. We can put it in the show notes. Um, but it's the idea of using different types of oils at different parts of the menstrual cycle to reinforce the estrogen and the progesterone. So uh, evening primrose oil in particular is really good for boosting your progesterone. And then the other uh, herb that I recommend usually is Vitex. So uh, Vitex is very gentle and it's supposed to be good for balancing hormones. And it takes, like you can take it for I think up to a year and a half. So it's sort of like a long acting herb. And it is often recommended to lengthen the luteal phase and boost progesterone. And then from the medical side of things, uh, if you have a cooperative medical practitioner, you could also get a proge prescription progesterone cream and try actually using like a progesterone skin cream or proge oral progesterone tablets to add in more progesterone. So that would be something for me that would be like if you've tried over six or eight months doing herbs and working with a practitioner and trying to improve your diet and it's still not working and you're in a hurry to get pregnant, you could do bioidentical progesterone supplementation to try to lengthen the luteal phase to allow for implantation. Well, I think that it's it's just so great to know that at least once you identify these issues, it's, there's some there's there are things that you can do naturally that can help mm -hmm. to lengthen the, the luteal phase and to help to help you get pregnant if that's what you're because that's usually when it comes up right when someone's trying to get pregnant definitely Unfortunately. Uh, definitely it's and it's really nice to have the charts to tell you exactly what intervention is needed in your case like it allows it to be customized and you're not like almost being a guinea pig of like try this try that see if it works like it's there's still some trial and error involved but with the charts you can see within a couple of months is this intervention working or not are we on the right track yeah. And then if it is, then it's very encouraging to say, let's just keep keep with it. Absolutely. Um, and specifically with the short luteal phase, what, there was a woman who came to the charting circle. I won't give her name because of privacy, but you probably know who I'm talking about, where she identified a short luteal phase when she was, uh, you know, just wanted this for birth control. She was a few years away from wanting to have a baby, but she was worried about it because she knew she did want to have a baby someday. So she sorted it out uh, in, you know, well in advance. And then when she wanted to get pregnant, she got pregnant very quickly. 
so now she's got baby number two and all of that was much easier because years ahead of time she identified the problem and solved it well and see in my perfect world this would just be taught to say every 11 year old girl and Mm -hmm. all the why not the men too everybody should learn it but specifically and just as you said in a perfect world you would have this knowledge and information way before you need it Mm -hmm. So you would be able to kind of chart your cycles and see, make sure that everything was healthy and and not be in a rush to get pregnant so that you have years to fix it if there's anything that you notice that's going wrong, that's going wrong. So I do know who you're talking about. And fortunately, I mean, it's the best case scenario. She was able to fix those issues years before she was even thinking about having a baby. Mm hmm. And And she still had effective birth control that whole time. So it was really in her hands. Exactly. Um, So we have talked about the short luteal phase and some of the things that we can do with it. Um, Why don't we go back a little bit to the mucus? So we talked about how hormonal imbalances could potentially either make a a woman have lots more mucus than the the healthy uh, range that you talked about or Mm -hmm. scant mucus. Um, Mm -hmm. Some of the groups that I'm part of for women who are trying to conceive or even women who are using it for birth control will comment that, well, I don't have much mucus or I don't see much Mm -hmm. or I don't, I never have egg white mucus or those types of things. Yeah. And that's definitely a concern for fertility because the, if you're trying to get pregnant, you want to have a good abundant amount of egg white mucus where you have at least a couple of days, maybe more where you see it constantly throughout your day. Like that's optimal fertility. And women do get pregnant on one day of non-peak mucus. But if you're trying to get pregnant and you're hitting your mucus days and it's not working, that's something to look at. And like the mucus is a reflection of the estrogen levels and the progesterone levels being in balance. So what you could do to improve it, uh, we typically recommend beta carotene. And uh, Geraldine, my instructor, always says that they give dairy cows beta carotene (laughs) because because dairy cows are too valuable to mess around with. Like they're very expensive animals. So they don't give them Clomid or experimental ovulatory drugs. They give them beta carotene Um, because the beta, the we've been talking about the luteal phase this whole time. And the the name the luteal phase comes from the corpus luteum, which is the part of the, I'll take a step back. When you're ovulating, there's like a little follicle that sort of swells up and then bursts and releases the egg. And that follicle then turns into the corpus luteum, which is a temporary endocrine gland. And it's what produces the progesterone. So that's why we call it the luteal phase. And Corpus luteum is Latin for yellow body. And so that yellowness has to do with the beta carotene, right? Carotene, carrots are yellow. So like really like vitamin A or beta carotene are essential for that functioning of the corpus luteum and for the length of the luteal phase. So to get more mucus generally, yeah, beta carotene we suggest. Um, Vitamin D uh, is definitely really good. Like a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D, especially I'm I'm in Edmonton. It's, (laughs) It's a lot of winter, it's a lot of dark. Um, if we're not getting a lot of sunshine on our bare skin. So supplementing with vitamin D and then, yeah, generally like, you know, good, um, like a good broad spectrum multivitamin, multimineral is useful as well. Yeah, that's really good to know. And that's super interesting about the beta carotene because I didn't know that, but it makes mm-hmm. perfect sense because as you said, the corpus luteum is, is yellow. And so, um, and so those types, those same types of, um, um, those same types of dietary suggestions would be helpful for women who either have scant mucus or, or not, either scant mucus or abundant mucus. Yes, and with with like I was sort of thinking more scant mucus when I was saying that, but with continuous mucus, yeah, we do want to look at overall hormone balance. Continuous mucus, we'd want to look at some sort of liver support. Like, is there? sort of a processing problem where there you're you know the there's like a like the estrogen is almost getting backlogged in the body okay. and it's acting on the cervix continuously so we'd want to look at like supporting the liver or possibly doing something like an estrogen cleanse i mean that's worth doing under the, with the supervision of a practitioner um, to say what's in the case what is the exact case in that person's scenario and then the other thing you want to do if there's excessive mucus is to look at cervical health so particularly if there's kind of like a gummy type of mucus that's like a little dried up ball of, of goo like you know if you get a new credit card and there's like that ball of sticky goo on the back yeah that's sticking it to it it's kind of like if you get mucus like that where it's gummy it's not really stretchy then we want to always look at is there a cervical infection because similarly if you're you've got a cold or something your nose kind of starts making like runny gooey snot 
and it's it's the same thing. It's like trying to clean it out. The cervix it does that as well. It's self cleaning, self protective. So if there's any kind of irritation or mild infection, the cervix will produce this gummy, gluey mucus to try to pull all the infective agents out. So if that's the type of mucus being seen, then I would say go and get a pap smear, get that checked out, see if there is any kind of mild infection, um, and uh, and look into that. And then of course we want to look into vaginal health. So to be clear of like, if you're seeing continuous mucus, well, is it actually cervical or is it a sign of a yeast infection? Is it candida? Is it, you know, any sort of bacterial vaginosis? And some women will be like, okay, yeah, I know what's normal for me and what's not. And so that if something's new, they'll be like, oh yeah, all of a sudden this is a yeast infection. But sometimes there can be sort of like a chronic thing that's been going on for a long time that it seems like it's normal. And then by charting, you can be like, no, this, like, you can tell if it's there all the time, then we want to say, well, what's going on in the background? Is the vagina out of balance? And then um, uh, how to sort that nat- how to sort that out naturally, like would be like looking at uh, doing any number of things to reduce the yeast load on the body. So like taking out sugars, like minimizing carbs, there's things you could do like oregano oil that's good for, you know, general like whole body cleanses. And then we always, the, you know, home remedies of, yogurt and getting your natural probiotics like boosting the the healthy probiotics and garlic and those kind of simple things yeah i was just thinking and it probably wouldn't hurt to eat some fermented foods to try to help to restore that gut flora balance all throughout your body as well as your vagina exactly yeah i couldn't agree more i think it's a really great place to start across the board is adding in fermented foods yeah it plays such a it makes such a big difference um and so in going kind of back to some of the other um some of the other charting concerns that can can come up. I, I remember recently reading a comment by a woman and she posted her chart and the temperatures were just kind of all over the place for a really long time. And she, I think that when you read Taking Charge of Your Fertility, when you first start charting, you assume that you your cycle should fit in and you try to make it fit in to what they're saying. But mm-hmm. to me, it was clear that she hadn't ovulated. There was no pattern of temperature. So what happens uh, if a woman starts charting and realizes that she's not even ovulating so uh yeah again that can be a complex case i I mean it first of all you want to like we were saying do the 10 minutes of uh do do your temperature for 10 minutes because sometimes if your charts are all over the map that's the first thing i want to look at is the thermometer accurate and is your technique going to give you good results because if you're not taking it for 10 minutes you can get the bouncing up and down so let's assume she's done that and she's still there's no nice temperature shift with her ovulation she's just seeing up and down so uh, in a case like that i'd want to look at the rest of the health history so be like is there like reasons for anovulation could be many and varied like we definitely want to look at is there a thyroid issue if there's hypothyroidism uh, the, and I've seen this where the, with, when you're hypothyroid, the, the thyroid gland affects the entire metabolism. And so if your thyroid is, gland is underproducing, then the whole metabolism of the body slows down. And sometimes then the body almost goes into this response of like, it's like a, we're in a famine. So we have to conserve every possible ounce of energy and reproduction is superfluous. So if that's the case, then, you know, you want to look at whether there is something like that going on, like a you know hypothyroid or adrenal fatigue, um, I, I mentioned this on the last show actually. Like I had both of those things, and my period stopped. Like my body was under so much stress that I just wasn't menstruating because I was trying to trying to recover. Um, so yeah, so look at like you know if there is sort of a chronic fatigue type thing accompanying the lack of ovulation, we want to investigate the hormone situation with regard to thyroid and adrenals and the rest of the the overall health and. We want to look at weight in a case of anovulation. So sometimes if women are extremely thin, um, then there's just not enough body fat to support ovulation. Like you do need a certain percentage of body fat. And it varies from women to women. Like some, you know, some people are naturally just tiny and small boned and they don't seem to have a lot of body fat and others, you know, need a, a higher percentage. And that's something that's a challenge given the standard of beauty right now, which is mm. that, you know, there's this perception that to be healthy is to be extremely thin. And so somebody who is exercising a lot and, you know, really has that um, sort of that, that beauty ideal might then find that she doesn't have enough body fat to support healthy ovulation. So we'd want to look at that. And also like the um, female athlete concept or even somebody who's not a professional athlete or a hard, high level athlete, but is still exercising a lot, that can put a strain on 
on the entire system and can suppress ovulation. And if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, if you're being chased by a tiger, it's not the best time to have a baby, right? <laughs> or, you know, if you're going in a caravan across the steppes and you're covering like 100 miles a day, your body's like, you know, this maybe isn't the best time to have a baby. And so the modern equivalent is if you're on the treadmill for two, three hours a day, it's like, whoa, okay, we're under severe stress. We're in fight or flight mode, not the best time to ovulate. So you just want to look at that and say, are those kinds of are there those kinds of lifestyle factors or is there some other kind of hormone imbalance? And then what can we do to make sure the woman is, you know, supported and reduces stress in her life and is properly nourished, is getting lots of healthy fats, is like you said, fermented foods, good whole foods diet, and just generally looking at the the whole picture and trying to restore her health so that ovulation can come back. The other thing to look at uh, is uh, trauma. I think that that can be a factor for some women if there's a history of sexual trauma uh, or emotional trauma that the body has a lot of different ways of dealing with it. And if you're in a situation where you don't feel safe or there's sort of blocked emotions that are being held in the body, that can affect ovulation as well. So then to explore that with a, with a counselor who does body-centered therapy and look at saying, what, what can you do to feel safe in the world where it would be safe to have a child and not like you're under this constant threat of attack? Yeah, those are such great points. And not necessarily the first thing you would think of um, if, if a woman, you know, if you're not ovulating. And so it's really great to be able to, to think about all those different possible reasons. Um, it just in, in terms of figuring out what's what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. And you mentioned uh, the thyroid issues and how the thyroid has an impact on overall metabolism. And mm-hmm. since the basal body temperature measures essentially your body's metabolic rate um could you tell um, could you talk a little bit more about how thyroid issues can be identified on on the chart yeah definitely so like you say yeah exactly it's through temperature is one of the biggest clues that there's a thyroid issue and if your temperatures are low then that points us to the fact that it could be low thyroid because your thyroid affects your metabolism it's like turning up the thermostat a few a little bit so i mean if your temperatures are so low that they're not even on the chart definitely we want to investigate thyroid issues hypothyroid and I would say if they're much below about 36.4 preovulatory, that's when we would want to say what's, you know, what's going on? Is there a possible thyroid connection? And uh, like I would say like, you know, a good healthy range would be about 36.4 to 36.7 degrees Celsius prior to ovulation. And then about 36.7 to 37.1 degrees after ovulation. Um, and so then if the th- if your temperature conversely is above that, if you're like 36.8 before you ovulate, then we're like, is there a hypo or a hyperthyroid issue where your thyroid is overactive? And um, uh, ruling out, of course, things like a fever or, you know, some other reason where you, there's an infection and you have a high temperature. So assuming that everything else is, is, uh, is compensated for. So besides the temperature variation, it would show up on the chart often as subfertility. So you might still be getting a period, you might still be ovulating, but that's where we'd start to see like the really scant mucus. We'd start to see the shorter luteal phases. We'd start to see uh, spotting before your real period starts. So kind of like, you know, brown spotting or a little bit of red bleeding like a few days before where it's like it can't quite hold on. Like there's not enough progesterone to keep that uterine lining in right in place. It's kind of starting to leak out. Um, be looking at a later ovulation. So if you're looking at like longer cycles and the ovulation is like day 17 to 18 or later, we always want to investigate thyroid Uh, as well as a trailing period. So like you're, you know, you maybe have a few days of heavy bleeding and then you just keep getting spotting. Your period goes on for six, eight, 10 days. It's kind of dragging out like that. That's another sign we want to investigate thyroid too. Well, I I just, I really appreciate you going through all these different, um, all the different health issues because as you're talking, I just keep thinking of all the different health issues that you're bringing up and how they're all related to your menstrual cycle and how much these disturbances in your menstrual cycle can, can tell you about your overall health. And mm-hmm. I know working with Geraldine as well, she always used to say that, was it the sixth vital sign? Is that what she said? The fifth vital sign, yeah. The vital sign. I don't know how many vital signs there are, yeah. but, but she always used to say mens- um, the mens- menstrual cycle is the fifth vital sign because it shows... Uh, it's a, a measure of your health. So um, mm-hmm. I think that's the takeaway from today's show that not only can fertility awareness be used just to, to chart and to, to, you know, get pregnant and to 
whether you're trying to get pregnant or you're using it for birth control, but it, it can just give you such a reflection of how healthy you are, essentially. Totally. Definitely. And I, I love that analogy with the fifth vital sign because I can't remember what all the other ones are either, <laughs> but there are things that like physicians would use as a diagnostic tool. So you'd look at like the pulse, uh, breathing, um, I can't remember the rest of them, reflexes, stuff like that. Like just things that are like, are you alive or not? And basic indication of like, if you, you know, like old school diagnostics would be like, you can check the pulse and be like the heart rate and how fast it is and how vigorous it is tells you a lot of things about the body. I know traditional Chinese medicine uses the pulse a lot for a diagnostic. Um, so yeah, similarly, like th th there's such a wealth of information, like so many things in the body show up in the menstrual cycle and somebody who's trained to chart her cycle in this specific way immediately has a lot of knowledge and then by going to a practitioner who can interpret it it you really get a, a window into exactly what's going on well and it's such a difference from any one any woman who has gone to the doctor with any of these concerns regarding her menstruation menstrual health and is essentially just told to go on the pill or yeah something some derivative of that and essentially well it doesn't matter um right just go on the pill and figure it figure it out later um mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, we're reaching kind of towards the end of the time we have today. And so I have a couple more questions for you and then we can wrap it up. But sure. um, one of the questions I would have or one of the questions I have, I'm trying to pick because I have, I, you know, I always have too many questions. <laughs> yeah. But um, so for any women out there who are trying to decide, maybe they're on the pill and they're trying to decide that maybe they're listening to this podcast because they're trying to learn a little bit more about fertility awareness and trying to decide whether or not to go off the pill. So for a woman, you know, that's listening, that is thinking that they want, they don't want to get pregnant now, they're not ready, but maybe they want to get pregnant within the next two years or next five years. Um, they're still on the pill. They're scared to come off of it because they don't want to get pregnant. What advice would you give to that woman? Uh, well, I, I think it always depends on her circumstances. Like I'm very respectful of people need to do what they're ready for. So if somebody's not ready to come off the pill or she's, you know, it would be disastrous to have an unplanned pregnancy, I can respect that. I know it is a scary decision. Uh, but for somebody who's like, you know, like I'm, I'm ready I'm, and who is willing to be patient with the learning stage of charting and make sure that she's using a backup method for the first few months while she's learning as far as like making sure she's using condoms or spermicide or or pulling out or whatever and has the cooperation of her partner to do that um then yeah i always say better ovulate than never <laughs> <laughs> there's no time like the present to learn charting and i i you know just strongly advise anybody who's considering it to find a teacher and to learn from a teacher because you can really uh, speed up the process by getting somebody to guide you through it. Trying to do it on your own is definitely, uh, it's very easy to get confused. And as we've gone through so many things today, like you could encounter all kinds of things on your charts and not know how to deal with them. And last show we were talking about the driving school analogy of like, if you're learning how to drive, nobody just puts you in a car with an instruction manual and says, figure it out yourself. And that's the equivalent with charting. Like you, you know, when you're learning to drive, you need, you take driver's lessons and you practice and you have somebody who's been there who tells you how the traffic circle works and you know how to like how to parallel how to park on a hill how to parallel park and i kind of want to take that analogy even a step further because it's like what's the difference in complication of driving a standard versus driving a stick shift so if you're learning to chart you don't know in advance how complicated your vehicle is going to be so to speak so you know somebody with really normal predictable cycles it might be about as complicated as driving a golf cart where <laughs> You learn it, it's like, yeah, stop and go. This isn't very hard. How much danger could I get into? But somebody who has a more complex situation, you know, then we're going into like stick shift versus, you know, regular, an automatic. That's what you call it, an automatic versus a stick shift. And then what if you get somebody who's like hormonal complexity is like a Boeing 747, where it's like, you're not going to learn to fly that by yourself. And it's, you know, I just really encourage anybody who's considering it to get the support because you don't know in advance what's going to turn up on your charts. And it's really, really valuable to have somebody just walk you through it. And if you come out at the end of it being like, hell yeah, I can fly a 747. Like you have no idea what I've been through with my menstrual cycle. Like that's a real accomplishment for somebody. And I think it needs guidance to get you to that point. It's, it's very difficult to figure it out on your own, especially because there's only so much you could learn from a book or so much you could learn from the internet. You don't know what the quality of information is like. Absolutely. And I would, I would have to throw in there that it's the beginning stages that are truly the most difficult because I started driving a standard six years ago after driving an automatic to go along with the analogy. And at mm -hmm. first you had to think about every little thing. 
And now it's, it's just, I'm on autopilot. I don't think yeah. about it at all. And it's the same way with charting. Even if you have a challenging start, uh, you'll get to that point. If you stick with it, you'll get to the point where it's like second nature. Yeah. And so if anyone's scared, they're hearing all of the bad things today or all of the complications, all of the challenges that a person could encounter. It's not to say that it's, it's so difficult either. I mean, there's certain complexities, but like anything else, once you get the hang of it, you can, you can figure it out, especially, exactly. especially with a, an excellent teacher to guide along. And so I guess I'll leave it off. Uh, was there any other, uh, we talked about a lot of different things today. Uh, was there anything else that kind of uh, was at the tip of your tongue or anything else that you were hoping to kind of share with, with the listeners about this topic? Uh, I think I want to just close the same way that we did last time, which is to talk about the resilience of the body. And I really believe that charting is a way to communicate with your body and to find out what the body's messages are saying. And sort of the longer longer of a time you spend charting, the deeper you get to know yourself. And the more that I've personally found that my relationship with the body, my body has become a partnership. So, I mean, when I was younger, especially like in my early teens, and I was like, what is this period business? It's, I don't want anything to do with it. It's gross. I wish it would go away. And as, as I've gotten older, it's been more like, then I was sort of, you know, early twenties, like feminist, like, yeah, periods are awesome. You know, <laughs> like up with the uterus and, <laughs> yeah. and all that stuff. Right. And now it's sort of, a, it's just been an ongoing deeper relationship of like, you know, I still have, still have days where I'm like, oh, I'm tired. Like I, you know, it's, it's like tempting to want to ignore the messages from my body from time to time. And I think that's like really cultural pressure to be like, we have to be on all the time. We have to be working all the time. We have to be productive all the time. So I know even, you know, for myself, it's not a perfect thing, but I do feel that through charting, I've really gotten to know that part of myself and come to accept it and come to understand that if my body has a message, I need to respect it and that I'm better off in the long run. So if my body's saying, hey, you need more sleep before your period, you tend to be more tired then. If I respect that, I end up being a lot healthier and happier. Or if my body's like, hey, you're low on mucus, you should probably take some beta carotene to boost that. I'm like, thank you. Thank you for that message that I need more beta carotene. That will help me with my eyesight and it will, you know, with my energy levels and everything. So I, I'm really just increasingly seeing it as this collaborative partnership that I that I have my, with my body and just this deepening of of knowledge and wisdom. I just find it I find it really profound and I've found that as I listen to my body, I have the opportunity to really heal in a deep way. And that's why I got into this work to offer that to other women. Well, I love that. I love that. And I, I can I can echo your sentiment, because after years of charting myself, it's, it's just, it's just, I don't know, just like you said, it's, it's like a partnership, a relationship, you really realize that what you do impacts your your health, because you can see it on your chart. It's, <laughs> and mm -hmm. so you don't often realize how how much control you do have over your own health, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and so I know that, um, I, I, yeah, we've talked about so many different things today. And, I, you know, I just can't thank you enough for joining me again on the podcast. Uh, we My could pleasure. talk for hours. I mean... Yeah, we're having a hard time wrapping it up. But totally. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so how can our listeners get into contact with you? Okay, well, they can definitely check out my website, which is uh, betterovulatethannever.com. We'll have it in the show notes. Uh, and I'm on Twitter at Rose Uchuk. Uh, we'll put that out there as well. And uh, as on the previous show, I'd like to invite any of your listeners to contact me to take me up on a free consultation. I'm offering a limited number uh, each month. So if any of your listeners would like to apply for one, they can check out my website and uh, there'll be information on how to do that. Oh, that's just awesome. Well, Rose, I'd like to thank you so much for coming back to the show and sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Uh, and experience with our audience once again. I'm so happy that we were able to reconnect through this podcast. And I just feel that our listeners are so fortunate. Uh, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. But over time, I really hope to just keep expanding and keep sharing this information with anyone who wants it. <laughs> yeah, the, no, I, I'm looking forward to it. I'll be glad to be back on the show again. This has been great talking to you. And I'd also like to thank you for your amazing special offer that you've extended to our listeners, um, because it's so valuable to be able to work one-on-one -on -one with an experienced teacher, as we've talked about. So, um, so thank you so much, and thank you for being here. And uh, I guess we'll talk again soon. We'll be in touch yeah, soon. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just let me know. I'll be happy to come back on the show. Okay, can't wait to have you back. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for listening. You made it to the very end. Again, you're awesome. If you enjoyed today's show, please tweet me at Fertile Friday or uh, stop by the blog and leave a comment in the show notes for t- today's episode at uh, fertilityfriday.com. And you can also find me on the Fertility Friday Facebook page, which is www.facebook.com slash fertility Fridays. Uh, so until next time, be well and happy charting.